this section is all about embracing technology, transforming government and governance. And I have sitting next to me somebody who's sitting in the wings waiting to do just that. We're going to talk about both your experience as an MP uh, for Leicester and also your, your, your hopes for what you'd like to do because you are currently Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. And that is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Ashworth. So we're going to be talking, first of all, from a governmental level. And then after you leave, I'm going to bring in some folks from the private sector to try to discuss about how they might implement some of the things that you talk about. So I'd like to start, Jonathan, you're an MP representing Leicester South, mm -hmm. very prominent uh, Indian origin electorate mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. East Midlands of England, <clears throat> the largest Indian population in the UK, yeah. I believe. So I'd love to know, first of all, what the opportunity is there. Relations have been a little shaky uh, between, between the Labour Party and India. I, when I spoke to Sir Keir Starmer, he really was very firm. We are looking forward, not back. Tell me what the opportunity is for you. Absolutely, and can I say I'm absolutely delighted to be here this afternoon to talk about the relationship between the United Kingdom and India. And I can bring my own perspective, not just as a member of our shadow cabinet, somebody aspiring to be at one of the most senior levels of our government next year, should my party win the general election next year, but also, as you've indicated, as a Member of Parliament for Leicester. Leicester, the city where we have uh, a, a huge Indian uh, heritage uh, population, probably the biggest Indian heritage population uh, in Europe. And the fact that our, our leader and prospective Prime Minister was here uh, earlier in the week and that you've got other senior Labour politicians here, I think is an indication of how seriously we take the relationship with India. Yes, you're right to point out that there have been one or two issues in recent times. But the friendship between India and the Labour Party is deep and does go back many, many years. But more importantly, we need to look to the future. And our relationship shouldn't be based on nostalgia or shouldn't mm -hmm. be based on what happened uh, uh, years ago. It should be based on the fact that both the UK and India can work together in partnership to confront so many of the big economic challenges that both our countries face. And I know from being an MP in Leicester, where Leicester, as many of you here will know, and many of the people uh, uh, watching online will know, has benefited from uh, generations, from families coming to Leicester, either directly from Gujarat or, or other parts of India, or most famously, of course, in the 60s and 70s, coming via the different East African countries, Uganda, mm. Malawi, uh, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, uh, and so on. Give us some examples of some of the companies um, based there that are, are positively impacting the UK economy at the moment. Well, this is one of the things I really wanted to talk about because in, 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 in Leicester, our links with India are so, uh, are so deep uh, uh, and they're real deep bonds. In fact, uh, uh, in Leicester, we celebrate, as India does, uh, every, every, every festival and indeed... Uh, uh, for many, many I've seen some pictures on your website, actually, of you celebrating those festivals. Uh, we celebrate uh, um, Diwali, Vaisakhi, Eid, and for those who may be celebrating Eid today, Eid, Eid, Eid Mubarak. Um, it's, not, it's not possible to be the MP for Leicester, by the way, without <laughs> picking up a bit of Gujarati, so Kemcho. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> Marunam, Jonathan Ashworth. Uh, <laughs> that's about as far as it goes, I'm afraid. Uh, um, but, uh, and I've had the immense privilege of visiting India. Uh, 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 um, probably about, about six, seven or eight years ago now, maybe a little, a little bit more. And I really want to build on those links because when you look at the trade that we do with India, um, it, it, it's one of our most important trading partners, but I think we can go so much, so much mm. further. It's why we're very keen to pursue um, a free trade deal. But I think there's more that we can do in, in these Midlands. I've been, look, Liz Kendall, who is another Leicester MP, well, Liz Kendall and I, we are, we are determined to establish a Leicester-India trade partnership. Hmm, interesting. Some other, some other parts of the UK have it. I think Manchester has one. I think the, uh, the West Midlands has one. Yet we, yet we don't have one for Leicester, which actually just seems such a missed opportunity. What would that look like? Given the very deep, the, the very deep uh, links. Well, I think that's an opportunity for the business links that, that we already have uh, to develop, but also to bring new links. Uh, look, one of the great things about Leicester is not just that we have these business links, is that higher education is one of our most important exports mm. as well. Now, 
Uh, India has been celebrating, or did celebrate last year, 75 years uh, of independence. A, a remarkable journey to freedom, as uh, Prime Minister Modi talked about when he addressed Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago or so. But it's also the 75-year anniversary of our National Health Service. Mm. And the links between healthcare, both historically between the United Kingdom and India, uh, have been deep. But we can build on these further in the future. So there are many students who will come to Leicester to study uh, in medicine. There are many uh, uh, nurses and healthcare uh, professionals who will come to the UK to practice in our healthcare service. But I know, and we saw this in the pandemic when I led for my party on health matters, that the, the, the innovations and uh, design and uh, 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 research in pharmaceuticals in India uh, not, el not only helped India escape from the pandemic, it helped the world escape. And I think there's mm. more we can do, linking up our great research institutions here, who we do have world leaders here in the UK, in life sciences, in pharma, in biotech, linking up with the uh, pharmaceutical sectors uh, in India as well, particularly around uh, 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 drug design. So I'd like to talk about what happens if Labour do win the next election. You'll inherit the Department for Work and Pensions. Yeah. It's got a few challenges. Yeah. Uh, it has a few technical challenges. <laughs> I, I noticed that um, in April, the phone lines were jammed ahead of a crunch deadline to buy state pension top-ups. Now, what's incredible about India is that they're, is, they're using technology to, to leapfrog, to jump over some of these issues. Talk us through what you think the challenges are and how technology might be able to help. Yeah, I'm really pleased you've asked me this question because I think there is huge potential to deepen the relationship here. Uh, and this is something I'm really keen to explore and to talk to uh, experts here today. I've been looking into uh, design, um, I beg your pardon, and data, uh, uh, and tech, and AI recently. Last week, I was at Cambridge University where I'm the policy fellow uh, talking to a bunch of experts about the potential of AI. And actually, who is the world's leader in using AI to improve welfare services? Who is the world's leader in ensuring that AI and design, data, and tech can provide the citizens with their, with, with their rights, to, with the right payments, the social security payments that they are rightly mm. entitled to, or providing their citizens with opportunities to progress? And it is India. And I think as Prime Minister uh, Modi said when he addressed Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago, this, is, this has been uh, a remarkable progress. And when you look at the United Kingdom's Department for Work and Pensions, if I was to become uh, the Work and Pensions Secretary, if I was lucky enough to become uh, the Work and Pensions uh, Secretary, I'd be running a department uh, where we have around uh, over £200 billion pounds worth of transactions, mm. where we have a data and tech budget of, of one and a half billion pounds, where, we're, where we've got the biggest IT estate probably in Europe, or one of the biggest IT estates in Europe, where we're dealing with an IT system which is, I think, 50 million lines uh, of code. That's a lot of compute. Mm -hmm. And yet, despite all of that, uh, in the last year or the last set of figures, we had eight billion pounds worth of errors uh, and fraud. 40% of claims processed late Pensioners are missing out to the tune of £2 billion worth of their rightful entitlement, something called the pension credit. And I think not only can technology and AI, not even the most advanced generative AI systems, but just the AI that has been developed over the last 10 years can be better utilised in the UK to ensure that our citizens rightly get the, the entitlements on which they are, uh, they are eligible for. And I really want to learn from India and the tech companies in India and government officials in India and perhaps some of the people who are here today about how we can uh, best adopt some of the remarkable progress that we, we, we have seen in India on this front. So if we break that down, it looks like there's, that you'd like to, <clears throat> you're inviting potentially the private sector from India to, to come and, and talk to you about how we make sure that people get their pension entitlements. That's one side of it. And there's also the Department for Work, right? So there's a whole idea around reskilling, around yeah. jobs, around uh, how you match people to jobs, how people who have potentially, they have potential, but maybe not the skills, how you retrain them as well. Talk a little bit about the opportunity yeah. for technology yeah. there. Yeah, so the, department, so the, the UK system, uh, the welf our welfare department, both delivers the benefit entitlements, whether that's the pension or a disability sickness benefit, 
but we're also responsible for labour supply, for getting more people uh, into the workplace and ensuring that people who move into the workplace are, uh, are equipped, have the skills, uh, and have the coaching, have the support uh, uh, for, for the modern world. And we know that these advances that we're seeing in, in AI is going to change the labour market. Now, but I'm not a... I don't, I don't quite accept some of the arguments that it's going to destroy lots of jobs. Uh, I actually think it's going to uh, make our economies more productive. It's going to improve output. Look, we've already seen automation change the way in which routine processing jobs work, mm. routine data entry jobs work. But AI is most definitely going to transform uh, middle middle tier jobs. It's going to put, it's going to make those jobs more productive. It's going to it's going to be a tool. But you are going to need human oversight. You are going to need people to act as uh, uh, as gatekeepers mm. because we have seen in the I'm sure you've seen uh, in, in the re recent weeks some professionals getting caught out by the use of uh, mm. generative AI. The famous lawyer in New York who used uh, ChatGPT to provide his provide um, uh, uh, case law, and it turned out that the uh, uh, chat GPT had completely mm. made it all up, and the it's... judge caught him out, and he's had to pay $5,000. Mm. He's been fined $5,000. Or there's a candidate in Toronto at the moment who's running for, I think, for mayor of Toronto, and has used AI to produce his adverts, yeah? And he's put these adverts out there, this political candidate, and in one of the adverts he's put out there, he didn't notice it. He put out a woman, these two people, and the woman has got three arms. <laughs> he didn't notice it. So it may well be that some of this stuff will, as it learns, adapts, as, and, and so on. But, in the, but the point being is, I don't accept that somehow that, you know, robots are going to take over everything and mm. humans are not going to have any role. I think humans will always still have to act as the gatekeepers. But it will allow us all to become more productive in what we do. And I think this is a really exciting moment. It's a really exciting moment. And I think... And as, as I say, I think the, uh, the skills and the intelligence and the thinking that we've got in the United Kingdom can work in partnership with that intelligence and, that, and, the, and those skills in India. And, I, and that's something I really want to develop. So what companies are you looking to partner with? What partnerships would you be interested in um, hearing about in terms of the Indian companies that might be able to partner with you if you were lucky enough, as you say, to, to take over the Department for Work and Pensions? Well, I mean, we've got a round table, I think, uh, a bit later on today when I'm going to meet some companies. I think it would be invidious of me to single out somebody <laughs> and say, Don't, that person we're going we're to be doing a deal with. But I think I, look, I'm, what I'm saying is I want to learn from everybody and I, want to, and I want to listen to everybody and I want to draw upon the expertise and because I'm absolutely convinced that there are better ways of delivering services here in the United Kingdom and we can. And, we can. and, and a Labour government, and look, Politics is politics. There's ups and downs. Who knows what will happen? But at the moment, things are looking very uh, are looking better for the Labour Party than in more recent general elections. The next Labour government cannot deliver its agenda unless we have partnerships with the private sector, mm. but also un understanding that we're part of a global economy and we want to have partnerships with economies like India's. What does good look like? When you mentioned there are some of the the concerns about what happens when you employ generative AI without some human oversight. But what have you, what examples do you look for? You mentioned India, um, some of the things that can be done when you apply technology to uh, the banking sector, to um, connecting everybody, giving everyone a digital ID. They're now building healthcare um, applications on top of this ID, payments on top of the, um, the ID. Give us a, a sense of, of how that applied to the UK could, could look, or have you seen an example elsewhere in the world where you'd like to see it here in the UK? Well, let me, let me give you a more uh, prosaic example, yeah. I mean, if you were un un unfortunate enough to lose your job in the United Kingdom and you have no option, no option but to turn to our welfare system, you know, our welfare system will pay you an unemployment benefit, uh, uh, and, and you would only receive that unemployment benefit if you met certain conditions, that you're prepared to look for jobs. We don't just pay people not to have a job. Uh, uh, you know, you've got to be prepared to look for jobs. You've got to, if, if we think you've not got um, the right skills, you've got to be prepared to go do s some training classes and things like that. Uh, and you've also got to show that you are applying for jobs, yeah? And in certain labour markets, at the moment we've got quite a tight labour market, but in certain conditions... Um, you are going after jobs which are just not suitable for you. You can actually use AI to better match you, 
your skills or to better to work out what, what skills you are lacking and to find you the right reskilling opportunities, mm -hmm. yeah? And also to find you the right job opportunities. We're not doing that at the moment. In fact, all we really do is we send you on a class on how to write a CV. Well, to be frank, what's the point of that? When we can, <laughs> when, when, you know, generative AI, when chat GPT, you know, GPT-4 and so on, can actually write the CV, can write your resume for mm. you. Why are we sending you on a class where we put you in a classroom and you all get told how to write a resume when you can just basically do that on, uh, you know, with these tools now? So we've got to completely change the way in which we uh, uh, skill people. I'm not suggesting that everybody's going to become a coder, obviously, but being able to use these tools and being able to manipulate these tools in the workplace is going to be vital for so many jobs now. So giving people those skills, those digital skills, uh, is so important and better matching you. Well, actually, at the moment, though, in the UK, we've got around 9 million people who've got poor literacy, poor numeracy, and poor digital. Yeah? And one of the problems with, one of the issues with digital is that people in the UK, and I don't see any reason why this perhaps might not be the case in other places, people feel slightly embarrassed about admitting that they've got poor digital skills because everyone sort of accepts that you can use the internet on your phone or whatever. So you need to find a way in which, if you are jobless, you can make sure that you are giving people an opportunity to learn how to use some basic digital, uh, digital skills, because in a way in which you know, mm. it doesn't embarrass them. Do you who, see what who, I mean? I do. Who does that well, do you think? Well, at the moment, uh, at the moment in the UK, the DWP will commission with some of the big outsourcing firms. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that uh, what you can make better use of is some of our SMEs in the UK on the ground. And I've actually seen this in Leicester, where, you know, as you can imagine, in Leicester, um, our Indian heritage population isn't just the people who came to Leicester um, via Uganda and Malawi uh, in the 60s and 70s. People have continued to come to Leicester um, and, and to, to this day. And there are many people who come to Leicester who need help with mm. uh, developing their English or written English. And it is often local SME providers on the ground who are better mm. at helping people learn it, either it's English as a second language or learn some digital skills than some of these big national providers that the DWP currently contracts with. So that is something I would want to explore, how we can give more opportunities to our small businesses on the ground uh, uh, in the UK for, to deliver those sorts of programs. I think that's fascinating. How do you do it at speed? How do you do it at speed? Well, look, that's a really great question, but in some ways, you've got no option. Mm. Yeah? There, there, there is a fierce urgency around these issues, but we are in a race. Yeah? And I want the UK to be uh, uh, leading that race or you know, at the top of that, at the top of the, top of the pack. But, so we've got no option but to do this. Yeah? We've got no option but to train and retrain uh, our labour force for these challenges of the future. So you've got to find a way. And the thing is, like, it's, you know, at the moment, and this is, not a, look, this is not a party political event, and you know, colleagues here will have different opinions about um, governments and so on, uh, but when I look at the, the statistics, the DWP is not acting with speed. You know? it, is not, it is not investing in the training that we need, it's not getting people prepared for the future, and our systems are too slow and too bureaucratic. Uh, and we've got to change that, and I think AI is a great way of, ch great way of changing it. All right, I really thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Let's all give a IGF thank you to Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Jonathan Ashworth. Thank you so much. Thank you.